Welcome, welcome, one and all. Uh, it is Sunday. Uh, it is four o'clock uh, on the East Coast in Washington, D.C. Uh, we are thrilled to have you all with us, all the more so because uh, we are taking this week, uh, Jesus, show you, how many you said, 34th week together? 34. 34th week together. Um, to celebrate one of my favorite wines. I'm actually upset that it's taken us this long to get to Beaujolais, uh, but I, I wanted to wait uh, until the moment was right for one of my uh, favorite wines. Beaujolais uh, represents, encapsulates so much of what uh, I love about wine. It is equally easy drinking um, and uh, it turns age worthy and profound. Uh, it expresses this wonderful sense of place and it embodies this region um, of France that um, encompasses some of the finest food and uh, some of the kind of warmest, um, most hospitable people um, you are likely to find anywhere uh, on uh, earth. Uh, and uh, it is a, a wonderful underdog uh, wine as well. Um, I like underdogs in all walks of life, but particularly um, in the glass. Um, so uh, Beaujolais, uh, the region we are tackling today, Gamay uh, is the grape. They are um, essentially synonymous. I can't think of another designation of origin in France that is dominated to the same extent um, as uh, Beaujolais is by Gamay. You know, that's excluding the, you know, odd monopole uh, here or there. But uh, Gamay, truly the star of the show. Um, and there's this, you know, wonderful romantic, intimate association, particularly in the northern end of Beaujolais, between uh, the grape Gamay um, and uh, these fabulous granitic uh, soils. Um, and uh, they really uh, enhance and enliven uh, one the other uh, so that uh, really um, the whole is greater uh, than the sum of the parts. And Gamay is grown elsewhere in the world, but it doesn't achieve the same heights anywhere else. Um, most of you uh, will recognize uh, Beaujolais um, as an easy drinking bistro wine. Uh, it achieves its most famous expression in uh, Beaujolais Nouveau, uh, which will be hitting the market, dropping this Thursday. Um, uh, it is uh, Le Beaujolais Nouveau Est Arrivé is the, uh, the uh, popular slogan. Um, in English, they say it's Beaujolais Nouveau time because uh, we're incapable of translating Est Arrivé, but uh, that doesn't drop until Thursday. Today we're celebrating the cruise. So there are 10 crews that roughly correspond to uh, the 10 greatest villages for Beaujolais in the region. Uh, and they make some of the most amazing wines in the world, um, you know, not just in this small corner of the France, uh, of France rather, but, you know, anyway, anywhere that I, that I can think of, you know, these are um, amazing terroir driven, uh, fabulous wines in need of more champions. So uh, we are talking less Beaujolais Nouveau. Uh, there'll be time for that uh, later uh, in the week. And we are talking uh, Cru uh, Beaujolais. And we'll go over that distinction uh, a little bit further uh, in the moment. But, um, you know, the story of Beaujolais, uh, it's a story of uh, revival. It is a story of this great underdog in the shadow of uh, Burgundy in the shadow of Pinot Noir, uh, but it's always also a, a fabulous story of changing tastes, um, you know, the fickle um, wine market, um, and both an environmental and a bit of cultural uh, revival. So, um, you know, Beaujolais is a wine as such, but uh, it is emblematic of these larger shifts um, in the wine industry, uh, particularly in the last several decades, um, which are equally worth uh, celebrating. Um, so, uh, without further ado, uh, we've hit uh, 4.04. Uh, for the sake of provisioning today, we have a bunch of bottles and then we have a, a flight as well. Um, you know, for the sake of our narrative arc, I'm going to start off with a couple of the bottles that we sold. Then we're going to move into uh, the um, individual crews thereafter. Uh, we have four wines in the flight. Um, if you have four glasses, more power to you. If you don't, you know, just at least break out a couple glasses and, and move backward and forward uh, between the wines. Uh, I know I say this a lot, but, you know, I find that way of tasting that dynamic, you know, having a yin to the yang, hugely illuminating. Um, and, you know, I am uh, want to say that there's, you know, no right or wrong way uh, to enjoy these wines. You know, I don't think you're going to uh, spoil the enjoyment of your Renier if you start with your Moulin Avant uh, and vice versa. So, um, you know, eat, drink, be merry. Beaujolais is a wine of pleasure. 
um, you know, it is, you know, a, a wine of, of immediate gratification. So, um, you know, have fun out there, get down to it. Um, without further ado, of course, uh, we're going to kick it off uh, with a, a bit of verse. And naturally, um, we're going to kick things off with uh, a bit of uh, French verse, um, of course, because this is, you know, ostensibly um, uh, a, a, a French lesson um, and uh, classically French um, for the sake of this particular poet, uh, Paul Valéry. Um, so this is a poem fittingly titled uh, The Lost Wine. This is obviously in translation. One day into the sea I cast, but where I cannot now divine as offering to oblivion my small store of precious wine. What, a oh, rare liquid, a uh, liquor rather, uh, willed your loss, some oracle half understood, some hidden impulse of the heart that made the poured wine seem like blood. From this infusion of smoky rose, the sea regained its purity, its usual transparency. Lost was the wine and drunk the waves. I saw high in the briny air forms unfathomed leaping there. Um, I love that, you know, that, that sense of, um, you know, mystery in the fathomless depths of the sea um, that come with uh, wine. Um, at any rate, uh, let's kick it off uh, with a, a brief, uh, you know, nod to history. I feel like we cover the same, you know, historical story with each lesson. And I feel like those of you who have been listening long enough could repeat it. Like, insert Roman introduction here, insert medieval monks here, insert, you know, occasional royals, insert modern revival, you know, peasants, you know, start to bottle their own wine. So largely speaking, it's the same uh, narrative arc here, but, you know, uh, there are always uh, wrinkles, uh, as it were, uh, just to give you a, a geographic sense of where we are. Um, Beaujolais is at the northern end of uh, kind of like the larger Rhone Valley region. So um, I'm going to zoom in on France. Hopefully no one yaks at home, but um, you can see, I uh, can imagine the Rhone snakes its way from Lyon uh, down to the Mediterranean. At Lyon, it splits off um, and becomes the Rhone and the River uh, Saone. Um, and apologies, uh, as always, to the actual French speakers uh, in our mix. But uh, the Saone winds its way uh, further north um, and uh, winds its way to uh, the east of both Beaujolais and Burgundy uh, uh, further to the north. So um, Beaujolais um, existed you know, along these Roman trade routes. The Romans made it that far north for the sake of their viticulture. Uh, they didn't make it much further north, it should be said. Um, but uh, there's a famous uh, volcano um, at the bottom end of the Cruz own brewery, Cote de Brewery, um, and uh, they planted vines there. They planted vines on the hillside of Mergon and Fleury. Um, so uh, they had their imprint. And, um, you know, the 10 crews that we're going to cover today, they each have their own kind of mascots. Um, a number of the different mascots, most famously Julianas, um, that is the Julius uh, of Roman fame. Um, you know, a number of them have Roman mascots, uh, as it were. Um, but um, Beaujolais is roughly considered part of Burgundy, which pisses me off to no end. Um, because uh, as early as the 14th century, um, the kings of Burgundy were outlawing the uh, kind of quintessential uh, Beaujolais grape Gamay uh, in their region. Yet the Beaujolais, um, you know, the merchants thereof, the winemakers thereof, you know, still forced to consider themselves vassals of, you know, this snotty wine region to the north that looks down on them. Now, I, I put the cart before the horse there uh, a bit, as I'm wont to do. Um, let's start with, you know, the region and the grape that it identifies with. So the region Beaujolais um, along this northern tributary of the Rhone, uh, the grape Gamay, uh, the Gamay story. Uh, so Gamay is the offspring, it should be said, of Pinot Noir, um, which is, you know, the most celebrated, um, you know, one of the most celebrated and romantic um, and aristocratic red grapes uh, in the world um, that, you know, certainly I can think of. Um, it's the offspring of Pinot, which, you know, as, you know, early as the um, kind of earliest uh, era of the Middle Ages, um, was brought forth into the world by Benedictine monks um, and occupied the uh, largely calcareous limestone uh, prized mid slopes of the Cote d'Or in Burgundy. Now, uh, Pinot um, went slumming with a, a more, um, you know, it should be say plebeian grape planted um, by the peasants of uh, the region. So the wealthy monks planting Pinot Noir, um, the peasants planting a grape called Y Blanc. 
Um, and Pino and Guay Blanc, um, it's kind of like a West Side Story situation or, um, you know, you know, Capulets and Montagues, you know, uh, different families, one of high birth, one of, you know, lower stature, um, they're going to kick boots. And uh, as such, um, you get all sorts of offsprings uh, when uh, this happened. And uh, one of those offspring famously is Gamay. But Gamay um, is a much more productive grape than Pinot. Uh, it is much easier to grow uh, than Pinot. Now you're thinking to yourself, um, you know, that sounds like a good thing to me, but for the sake of fine wine, that's a bad thing. And Gamay emerges on the scenes um, and quickly um, a lot of the growers adopt it because Pinot is a huge pain in the ass to make, even though it makes, you know, tastier wines. And they adopt Gamay. And as early as 1395, this bastard on the left side of the portrait, Philip the Bold, he decides, you know, the Gamay is diluting the reputation of my fine wines. And he's locked in this trade war with his brother in Champagne, or cousin, I forget. They're all related, um, but uh, they're locked in this trade war and he doesn't want the reputation of his wines uh, debased. Uh, so as such, uh, Philip, um, he calls out Gamay, calls it a, a grape with this very great and terrible bitterness. Um, he complains that it's injurious to the human creature. He calls it evil and disloyal, the disloyal Gamay. That is a sobriquet that has, has you know, kind of stuck to the varietal into the modern era. And as early as 1395, you know, he says, you know, no more Gamay in uh, the greatest vineyards of Burgundy uh, proper. But a funny thing happens because uh, Gamay makes its way south and uh, for whatever reason, uh, Pinot Noir does not thrive on the granite outcroppings uh, in Beaujolais, uh, but Gamay uh, absolutely does. Um, now we're gonna shift a bit. I wanna read you a, uh, a quote, um, you know, and, and the regions, the grapes are always, you know, kind of, you know, just like I'm um, advocating, you know, tasting two wines side by side, I feel like Pinot and Gamay, you know, they always exist in opposition one to the other. Um, and they share a lot in common. They're bright, you know, they're, you know, largely medium bodied wines or gastronomical wines, but, you know, they have these, you know, subtly uh, different characters uh, that uh, inform them one to the next. And I love what John Bonnet has to say on the subject. He is formerly the writer um, for um, the San Francisco Chronicle. Chronicle you know, this is total non sequitur, but they have the best um, wine writing of any periodical, um, you know, newspaper to date. Esther Mobley runs the roost there now. John Bonnet is off doing his own thing and writing books. But um, uh, he says about Beaujolais, he's saying that, you know, uh, it's a great region. Um, the crews, um, you know, were well established uh, in uh, the Middle Ages. And, you know, that's the truth. So, you know, as early as the 17th, 18th century French kings, drinking these wines. They're not identified as such as Beaujolais more broadly. They're identified by individual crew names, Chenas, Moulin Avant, uh, Morgon. Um, but, you know, they are widely lauded um, and they're quickly enshrined when France establishes its appellation system in 1936. John says, uh, they were already known to produce superior wines, not as stoic as Burgundy, but more sensuous and real. And here's the gold, uh, guys. If Burgundy was a love poem, Beaujolais was sex talk, and thus had enough obvious populist appeal that snobby types were bound to turn their backs on it, even if they found themselves drinking a lot. I, I love that uh, analogy, the, you know, immediacy of this wine, the sensuousness of it um, is, is worth celebrating. And, you know, if I've said it once, I've said it a thousand times, we are a sex positive uh, wine podcast here um, at uh, Tail of Goat Wine School. So, um, without further ado, we're going to drink our first wine and we're going to talk over, you know, production techniques when it comes to uh, the very Beaujolais uh, that we have uh, been uh, drinking. And we're going to talk over um, two, you know, pillars of uh, the um, region um, and the modern wine history of Beaujolais. Because uh, Beaujolais, it has this storied past, you know, it was consumed, you know, uh, locally and nationally um, by French royals, but um, post-World War II, its fortunes decline. It becomes synonymous with this product called Nouveau. Uh, thanks a lot, George de Boeuf, uh, who RIP just passed away and actually um, did a lot more good for the region than he did bad, depending on who you talk to. But um, at any rate, um, Nouveau is wine en primeur. Um, so it is an early snapshot of the vintage to come. Um, it exists in many regions of France. Uh, this notion of, you know, making a wine, you know, fermenting it very quickly and sending it out to market you know, in, in November. You know, that's not unique to Beaujolais. Uh, but Gamay, Gamay, you know, it does that very well, you know, the whole sex talk thing. Um, you know, it's just, you know, immediate in its charms. And, you know, that immediacy lends itself nicely to the style. Sadly, 
um, you know, this style is taken further than it should have been, and it becomes synonymous with the region and a, a marketing ploy um, that is George de Boeuf's Nouveau, that is this race to take the recently bottled Nouveau from Beaujolais to Paris, and it was a race, um, you know, and George de Boeuf was a marketing genius who popularized it, you know, in the, in the 70s and into the 80s. You know, he makes a river of wine, largely fermented with uh, industrial yeast called 71B, tastes like banana runs, and no one likes banana runs. Um, and, you know, sadly, uh, it becomes synonymous with, you know, the truly delicious and, you know, occasionally profound wine um, that is Beaujolais itself. Um, there is, fascinatingly enough, around the same time, a counter narrative percolating in Beaujolais, and it has everything to do with these two individuals. Uh, we're gonna talk to Jules Chevet first, um, and then uh, talk his disciple, uh, Marcel Lapierre. And, you know, uh, for this, you know, wine that is highly industrialized for this region that has suffered its soils denuded, exhausted through the application of, um, you know, these industrial fertilizers, chemical fertilizers after World War II, you know, it is nonetheless the birthplace of the natural wine movement. So it is both, you know, associated with this river of, you know, debased wine, so much wine that, you know, in 2001, they had to distill the bulk of it uh, because there was just too much of it for the market. Um, you know, in spite of that kind of modern history, um, there is this, you know, countervailing force that is, you know, the natural wine movement, um, a return to traditional vineyard practices, and a return to non-interventionist um, winemaking in the cellar. Um, but there's a lot to unpack there. So we're going to start with this Cuvée, uh, Jules Chavez. Um, and uh, it's a very fun wine. It is named, uh, it is a Beaujolais village. So um, uh, that is to say it comes from one of 34 villages um, that uh, are allowed to call themselves a uh, Beaujolais uh, village. And I'll flash back to the map so you can get a sense of where those villages are. Beaujolais is a larger region, um, is a, still produces a river of wine to this day. Um, in some vintages, it produces as much wine as uh, Burgundy, the rest of the region Burgundy, uh, to the north. Um, and, you know, that production sadly still dominated by large um, negotiation firms and co-ops. And, you know, the, the bulk of the wine, uh, the majority of the wine, um, is, is still commercialized, you know, plump to this day. But there are so many exceptions we're celebrating um, that I want to, you know, focus on those today. And uh, Jules Chevet um, is a, a really important um, reason um, for uh, the revival in the region's fortunes. So um, he is a fourth generation grower. He took over his family's negotiant firm at a very young age. Um, and beginning in, uh, he was a, a, a chemistry uh, student himself um, in school. And beginning in 1935, he begins uh, a collaboration with Otto Warburg, a Nobel winning um, uh, physiologist. Um, and Jules is interested in um, the kind of uh, biological underpinnings of the fermentation process um, and uh, his work in the vineyards. Um, and he sees um, the uh, kind of vineyards um, that he is working uh, that are exhausted by these chemical uh, treatments. Um, and he remembers the wines of his forefathers and um, he notices a gap there and you know wonders why the wines are less than they once were um, and wonders what the scientific underpinnings of uh, the kind of uh, fermentation process are. And he, you know, is really responsible for our modern understanding of a lot of processes that are hugely important um, to understanding how particularly uh, red wine in Beaujolais um, comes to the glass. And, you know, uh, those processes that we're going to talk over are malolactic conversion. And that involves the, um, in red wine and white wine, the conversion of harsher malic acid into uh, lactic acid. And it's a secondary process that happens after the initial alcoholic fermentation. Um, sulfur additions throughout the winemaking process. Sulfur is a very important preservative, kind of locks the wine in place. It's kind of like the embalming fluid of wine. And then carbonic maceration, which we're going to talk over very briefly. Now, uh, I want to um, briefly discuss, you know, the pyramid that exists in Beaujolais for the sake of these wines. So I'm drinking Beaujolais Village here, and that is a geographic designation. Again, your grape Gamay. Um, you can see the village uh, region here. That's 34 villages. A couple of villages have the right to append their name to Beaujolais. So uh, it could be uh, most famously like Beaujolais Lane um, uh, being, um, you know, one of them. Um, and uh, I'm trying to think of, you know, uh, uh, Beaujolais Latinier um, is another, uh, but largely Beaujolais Village um, is a step up from your kind of base level uh, Beaujolais. Um, and then you have the 10 crews, 
uh, which are the Madonna share entities of the world, which don't go by Beaujolais at all. They go by Renier, they go by Fleury, they go by Moulin Avant. So you're not gonna see Beaujolais Chenasse, for instance, on the label, you'll just see Chenasse. And it is on you, wine consumer, to know that that um, entails uh, Beaujolais. Um, just like, you know, Madonna doesn't say, you know, Madonna, American pop artist with a faux English accent, she just says Madonna, because everybody knows the rest. Um, now, uh, these are the uh, carbonic macerations. So uh, we're going to get a little nerdy. Um, uh, please uh, drink, um, you know, uh, during uh, the nerdery. Um, we talked all about, you know, uh, fermentation. We talked briefly here about malolactic conversion. Fermentation involves uh, a, a single cell organism, yeast. Um, and that single cell organism, it eats sugar, it creates alcohol and carbon dioxide. Um, now that is the most, you know, kind of important way that uh, alcohol gets to our glass for the sake of wine. There is a secondary enzymatic process. It is called carbonic maceration or kind of faultily uh, carbonic, um, you know, fermentation because it's not actually a, a, a type of fermentation as such. It is better understood um, as an enzymatic reaction. And what happens in uh, carbonic fermentation or maceration is that you get a conversion um, within whole grapes um, uh, of malic acid into alcohol. Um, and these are two grapes. So a precondition, important precondition for carbonic maceration in wine is that you have whole grape clusters. So you cannot destem your grapes. You have whole grape clusters intact and you just throw them into a vat, the whole bunches. Um, and in the absence of oxygen, so those are your two preconditions, whole grape clusters, you know, stems in the mix, grapes on the vine, um, you know, have to be harvested by hand. Um, and uh, lack of oxygen, CO2, um, often added to these sealed tanks. And in that environment, you get a conversion of malic acid um, into um, alcohol within the grape itself. And what happens in that environment is that you get a bleeding of color, you get less extraction of color uh, in the wine itself because um, all the polyphenols in the skins are not leached into the wine during the carbonic maceration process. Um, also, all those tannins are not leached into the wine. So wines that are made this way, they tend to be brighter and fruitier than wines made with uh, traditional red wine uh, fermentation. And people will often distinguish within Beaujolais between um, wines made in this cool carbonic style. So they cool down the tank uh, to heighten these lighter, fruitier aromas. Uh, typically fermentations that are done at cooler temperatures, they produce more delicate, fruity aromas. Uh, and they contrast that style of winemaking to uh, the more Burgundian method, where you're de-stemming your fruit um, and uh, your uh, winemaking happens in a more oxygen-rich environment, and you get coarser, more tannic wines. So on the one hand, you have something lighter, more ethereal, fruitier, and on the other hand, you have something coarser, more tannic, and bolder. Now, uh, it's, there's no such thing as a perfect carbonic ferment. Um, there's always gonna be some oxygen uh, in the mix, um, it should be said, you know, first and foremost. And, you know, if you just throw, um, you know, whole grapes, whole clusters into the mix, you're gonna get a little bit of carbonic. So people often will work with partial carbonic. So it's not the case that you have one or the other. And you have a lot of people, you know, um, adopting, you know, some of the one and less of the other. Part of the reason why um, uh, Jules Chavez uh, favored this method is that it allowed him to work with a uh, more limited sulfur regime. So he was looking at these wines in his region that were over sulfured, and he realized that if he made wine in a cold carbonic style, that he could add less sulfur uh, to the mix. And he saw that as a way to make livelier, more quote unquote natural wines. Now he saw, he was a very astute taster, Jules, um, and he saw that as a prescription that was kind of unique to Gamay and unique to Beaujolais. But he had a uh, myriad disciples, um, the most famous of them, uh, being uh, Marcel Lapierre. And uh, Marcel Lapierre, um, he, starting in the early 80s, adopts Jules Chavez's method. And uh, he, um, through the force of his own personality, attracts all these other winemakers, uh, Guy Breton, who uh, we'll taste a wine from shortly, Jean-Paul Thivenet, uh, Jean Foyard, um, uh, Kermit Lynch dubs them the Gang of Four, which is maddening. In French, they actually call them the Gang Lapierre. Um, which is more to the point because there are always a few people left out. Uh, Yvonne Metris included in the mix often in France. Uh, Joseph uh, 
uh, Chaminard um, is kind of the unofficial fifth member. So they're like a lot of unofficial uh, members of the quote unquote gang. What you need to know is that, you know, in the 80s, you have all these sons of this, you know, kind of backward, um, off the beaten path agricultural region. And they're saying, you know, we want to make wine, um, you know, more uh, in the style of our grandfathers, less in the style of, um, you know, this post-World War II, you know, industrial, um, you know, chemical um, mode. Um, and that is to be celebrated um, for these wines. And that um, goes hand in hand with this particular style that involves carbonic maceration, which makes these lighter, fruitier wines. So um, in Beaujolais, you have, you know, this story of terroir, which we're going to get into when we taste through our individual wines, and the story of methodology and the story of return to the land. So all these overlapping forces all at once. And if you're someone like myself that loves wine, it's really fun to tease those things uh, apart and understand them. And if you want to understand, you know, natural wine for better or worse, uh, for the sake of its abuses and for the sake of, you know, its more beneficent effects on, you know, the industry, then I think you have to trace it to its roots, um, you know, uh, with these characters, with you Chauvet, with the Gang of Four in Beaujolais, and trace it to the glass with these wines. Um, if you're drinking both these wines at home, you'll notice that they are not flawed. Uh, they are not mousy. They are not riddled with VA. They're fucking delicious, matter of factly. That's what natural wine should be. Natural wine should not be an artifice you know, kind of propping up sloppy uh, viticultural practices. Um, that would infuriate Jules Chauvet, um, you know, and Marcel Lapierre, and, you know, the surviving gang members. Um, you know, uh, there are far too many natural wines that um, are, you know, fundamentally, you know, flawed. And, you know, just lean into it, um, you know, because it's like a cool kids in the cafeteria. Oh, have you had the latest natural wine? The label's really cool, yada, yada. You know, we don't want that. Uh, the, you know, the, the wine should stand on its own two feet. It should be, you know, delicious and unflawed. But, you know, um, these wines have a life force. They sing. And this whole question of sulfur is really fascinating. Um, you're playing with fire when you don't add sulfur to your wines. Um, but, uh, you know, wines unsulfured, when they hit, they're thrilling. They're alive. Um, you know, it is, you know, uh, you know, like the, you know, playing with fire in the most exhilarating way. You know, when it goes off well, you know, it is, you know, good fun, uh, good fun. Uh, hopefully, you know, my nephews aren't watching this, uh, you know, uh, you know, Nikki and Calvin do not play with fire uh, if you're at home. Um, uh, I covered a lot there. We're going to taste in just a second. Um, Zoe, do we have any questions about, um, you know, uh, the underpinnings of, um, you know, the natural wine movement Beaujolais and this whole, um, you know, persnickety carbonic maceration uh, thing that I went over? Um, would you mind talking about how to chill different types of Beaujolais and then also how to age different types of Beaujolais between Village level, Nouveau, and then the Cruz? I would love to, though. Um, so uh, I think people, you know, often get locked in this idea that, you know, uh, these big, you know, massive, you know, red wines, the only ones worth aging, you know, uh, we dispel that here. We try to, you know, strength is not about, you know, alcohol percentage. It's not about, you know, extraction color in the glass game. He's a thin skinned grape, has these massive berries. That's why the peasants liked it. That's why Philip the Bold hated it. Um, you know, it's not gonna make big inky wines. You know, these two wines in particular, you know, very light and floral. And then if you're adding that whole cold carbonic thing to mix, you're gonna get something that's paler in color. Um, that's not to say that they can't age. So uh, the Cuvée Jules Chauvet, uh, 2014, showing very well. It's kind of a mature wine. Um, we're going to taste a Fleury that's also from 2014. It's a very classic vintage, um, which is to say, you know, um, the, you know, representative as of, of, you know, Beaujolais as it was once upon a time, uh, less representative of the new global warming reality. Um, but, you know, these wines will age, even the more um, humble village level ones. Um, the Cruz will age for decades on end. Um, they're beautiful. You know, we had a 98 um, Chaminard Morgon um, at uh, uh, Tail of Goat once upon a time. It was gorgeous. Um, it was a little fickle, you know, from one bottle to the next, there was variation, but that's true with a lot of um, older uh, wines. Um, you know, again, there are no great old wines, only great old bottles. You know, that is a, a, a very apt uh, truism. Um, you know, store them at the same temperature as you do everything else, cellar temp, 55 degrees, um, you know, or, you know, there and uh, put them in the basement, put them in a cold closet. Um, light is actually, uh, you know, even a more pernicious enemy in a lot of ways um, than, you know, warmer temps. Um, I'm going to move on to the cruise though, because I want to talk over these, you know, individual uh, spirit animals. 
um, and you know, uh, I promise to consider you know the the merits of these more kind of serious expressions um, of of Beaujolais, um, and uh, I, I want to do that. And we're going to start here um, with one of uh, the gang uh, members. So um, we're going to start with the Renier. For those of you drinking at home, uh, this is the wine that I'm working through at the moment, um, and. Uh, Guy Breton. I'm going to put a picture of Guy um, up because he's a beautiful man, uh, Guy Breton. Um, I, I sent around a picture of him, or I, I showed a picture of him in, in a video uh, that uh, we posted on our social medias uh, earlier this week. Um, I said that I thought he looked like Meatloaf. Um, uh, we had a commenter that uh, opined more uh, Captain Beefheart. I thought that was a good, um, you know, 60s, 70s uh, musical deep dive. Um, uh, but uh, that is Guy Breton. Um, to his friends, he is Petit Max. Um, he's a force of nature. Um, his hair is amazing. Um, he makes wines that are kind of like, um, I find them approachable. Um, uh, the Gang of Four, uh, historically based in, in Morgone. Um, and I'm going to pull up a, uh, an image of your 10 crews. Now, again, we are at the northern edge of um, the uh, kind of uh, larger uh, region of uh, Beaujolais uh, here. Uh, for the sake of the 10 crews. Um, and uh, so the 10 crews are all at the northern edge of the region. Um, what's really cool is that um, the um, wine nerds in Beaujolais, they're really leaning into, um, you know, their soil typing uh, when it comes to uh, their wines. So um, they uh, recently um, did this like amazing mapping thing that involved 15,302 soil bores, 979 soil pits, um, to really codify, you know, not only are we dealing with granite, but, you know, what type of granite are we dealing with? You know, are we dealing with more alluvial soils? There's quite a bit of limestone in Beaujolais. There's some volcanic soils, particularly in uh, Bury, and then uh, famously um, in, uh, uh, in uh, Morgon, um, in one of its most, most kind of storied uh, vineyards. Uh, and they, they really wanted to get a better sense of that um, so that they could, you know, double down on, uh, you know, the unique dimension of terroir from one vineyard uh, to the next uh, in, in their region. So um, uh, Guy Breton and the Gang of Four, all based in Morgon, one of the most famous crews. Um, you could think of it as like the Prince of uh, Beaujolais. Um, Moulin Avant, which we're gonna cover in a second, is the King, Fleury, the Queen. Um, the rest are, you know, lesser nobles, um, but, you know, content uh, as such um, in their lesser nobility. Um, uh, we're gonna drink a Renier to start off with here. Uh, you can see Renier uh, there. Um, uh, we are uh, uh, kind of uh, rock hounds um, here uh, at uh, Taylor Coat Wine School. Um, I'm going to share this amazing map with you. Um, uh, you're not going to be able to decipher it at all. Um, uh, so um, this is the whole region. Um, uh, you can see granites are uh, yellow through um, uh, red. Uh, so shit ton of granite, uh, especially in the north. Uh, your blue um, rocks uh, go to breed. Those are more volcanic. Um, and then your limestones are various shades of lighter, um, uh, kind of like green, um, as such. Um, uh, you can see, uh, and the, you can see like the villages don't entirely correspond with the, uh, crews, which is a bit maddening, but, uh, you can see, uh, Morgon here and then Renier, uh, just to its west. Um, you are kind of, uh, there's a, a ridge of mountains to the west, um, uh, in Auvergne, uh, west of Beaujolais. So, um, the vineyards of Renier are uh, at elevation compared to the vineyards of Morgon. Um, we're going to get even more nerdy here with a, um, a Renier specific uh, village map. Uh, yeah, hold your breath here. Um, you know, they, they drilled so many boreholes, guys. We really have to reward the effort here. Um, this is uh, get ready for all the soil types of the 10 crews. Um, double downing, uh, yeah, doubling down on it. So this is uh, uh, the Village Renier corresponds to the crew. Um, extreme close-up, Wayne's World style. Um, the Guy Breton uh, vineyards surround the village itself. Um, this wine comes from two different plots, uh, 100 plus year old vines that he inherited from his grandfather and a 30 plus year old plot uh, adjacent to the village where all the soils are granitic. Um, uh, because you're at elevation compared to um, uh, Morgon, you get later ripening and you get, um, you know, kind of uh, lighter uh, wines characterized by, you know, kind of a tanginess of fruit and freshness. Um, furthermore, this is made in that cold carbonic style, which is going to accentuate some of those brighter, more fruitier overtones. Zoe, what, pray tell, did you taste 
um, uh, in this particular uh, offering from uh, Le Petit Max, um, uh, the Guy Breton uh, Renier. Um, I love Guy's wines. They are always so very chewy to me, as we were talking about earlier offline. Um, I think that just like that sanguine that you were saying comes from the pink granitic soils, like really comes through. And then the fact that it's just unfined and filtered, it's really like chewy in those tannins. Um, I get a lot of like what we used to call um, like organic fruit leather and a very much like a dried fruit complexity, even though it still is like quite bright and, um, and like lighter and ethereal. Yeah, there's always something primal to me about these wines. Um... You know, uh, it, you know, it evokes that like fight or fight response. I, I don't know, but like there's a bloodiness here. It's, it's like, you know, it is you know, distinctly sanguine, distinctly briny. tastes like licking, you know, um, rocks uh, in its own in kind of mineral driven way. There's something thrilling to me about Breton's wines. I find them very approachable, but also kinetic. Um, you know, like they have this whole life force, you know, b behind them, um, you know, and you know, maybe that's because I like his hair, um, but maybe it says something about, you know, the wine uh, as well. Um, and, you know, I, I think it does what Beaujolais does best, which is it has that immediacy. It's charming. It's, you know, something, you know, uh, you know, it's, it's what the French call goyolon. It's quaffable, um, but it, it's equally, you know, interesting, you know, um, you know, it's a wine that you could linger over and, you know, tease apart for the sake of, you know, different dimensions. Uh, of taste. And, and I, I really, I, I love that um, about it. And it should be said that this notion of blending these vineyards is, is you know, very typical um, within crews. So even among the gang of four, they rarely until, you know, the last decade released single vineyard offerings. Now that has changed. Um, you know, both Guy Breton and, and more famously Jean Boyard have doubled down on single uh, vineyard bottlings. But historically, you would, you know, pick things apart a bit and, you know, make uh, a you know, individual crew wine, you know, that was, you know, a little more chorus or, or a little more, you know, kind of, you know, a cappella with, you know, four or five members um, than a single voice. Now that, that is changing some, you know, as we drill more boy holes and, and try to, you know, develop a, a more kind of postgraduate, um, you know, kind of appreciation uh, for, for the region. But, you know, I think this, you know, from, from older vines, you're going to get that more savory, gnarled, you know, concentration on this. But, you know, there's enough fleshiness here. And, you know, that's something that you're going to get from those, you know, still mature, still old enough at 30 plus years. Um, but I, I like that combination. Um, it's honestly it's something that Belgians do a lot in blending beer, you know, younger stock and older stock. And, and the two round each other out, um, you know, really beautifully. Um, now, I have a, a really fun box of rocks here. Um, and, you know, you can't see this at home, but there are 10 different um, you know, individual uh, component uh, slots here. Um, Danny Fisher, I apologize. Uh, this is like the TV tray that we borrowed from our neighbors and never returned, only it's way more amazing because it's representative of the 10 different crews in Beaujolais. That's right. We've got all the different types of granite represented in a box, um, you know, which lends itself naturally to the Kevin Spacey, uh, you know, uh, Brad Pitt. What's in the box? Um, well, it is essentially the 10 crews in a box here. Very excited about it. Um, I'm going to, you know, hold the rocks up for you uh, as we go through them. I'm sure it will be as rewarding for you at home as it was for the servers when I made them pass them around during our wine training starting. Uh, you got it with uh, Renier. So various types of uh, pink granite here. Um, this is Renier. Um, I'm not going to lick the rock. I feel like I should. Maybe I will. Yeah, yeah, um, you know, the mineral minerality to it, um, you know, uh, slightly saline, um, you know, certainly representative of, um, you know, the, the wine itself. But um, we're talking a lot about granite. I think we should try to kind of more fully understand granite before we move on. Um, and uh, this is, uh, you know, cut and pasted, um, or I'm quoting uh, a, a wine um, blog here uh, writing about granite. So um, for those of you playing along at home, you know, you get three types of rock, you know, uh, sedimentary, um, metamorphic, and then igneous. Granite is what's called an intrusive igneous rock, which is to say it is, uh, uh, you know, lava essentially, but lava that cools and hardens inside the earth as opposed to extrusive igneous rocks, which, you know, hit the surface and cool uh, that way. So uh, what is so special about granite there? Here's, I'm, I'm reading now, I'm quoting. Geology students learn it uh, in basic classes. It is coarse, uh, as a coarsely crystalline igneous rock that's formed under immense heat 
and pressure conditions far below the Earth's surface. A molten rock mass cools slowly, and crystals of various minerals are knit together in a tight mass. The actual composition can vary based on the chemical mix of this molten soup. It all becomes quite complex, and there are many rocks classified as granitoid in character. Um, back to the essence of granite itself. It's composed largely of quartz, feldspar, um, and minor components of mica, uh, hornblende, and other, mi uh, other minerals. Um, uh, another mineral that's very important in uh, Beaujolais uh, manganese, and we'll, we'll get into that in a second. Um, we most often associate granite with its pink hue. That is because the feldspar in granite contains an abundance of sodium and exhibits a pink color that stands out next to the clear white crystals and the black micas. A study of how igneous rocks form show that as the molten mass cools, micas crystallize first, followed by feldspar, followed by quartz. Um, but when they weatherize, uh, they decompose at a rate inverse to their formation. So uh, the quartz is actually the last to be created mica the first. So you get degradation of finer particles before the coarser ones. In vineyard soils, um, you know, what does that equal? Because, you know, the vines don't grow on these hard rocks. Vines need weathered rock. They need minerals. They need, um, you know, rock plus air plus water plus a little dash of organic material. Um, so it should be said that granite tends to devolve into coarser sand. Um, and, and that kind of floats its way to the top of this coarser sand and then the finer minerals, um, you know, they compose, you know, uh, the deeper uh, substrates. Um, but that gives you great water shedding properties in sandy soils and it gives you great heat retention in sandy soils. And that's something that GMA really loves. And then from one crew to the next, you get, you know, different mineral components and then different uh, degrees of, you know, uh, kind of finer, um, you know, sands or God forbid, um, you know, uh, uh, silt, um, you know, uh, or, you know, even finer um, particulates uh, in the mix. And, and that, you know, at the end of the day, you know, how heavy these soils are, where it's just, you know, sand is actually pretty light soil um, at the end of the day, you know, determines uh, what the wines uh, taste like. So uh, we're going to switch gears. We're going to move uh, from, you know, the rock you saw earlier to a different rock uh, in Chenasse um, uh, and move from Renier. And, and I, I didn't cover the spirit animal here. So um, Renier named after, uh, uh, wait for it, Gallo-Roman nobleman, Reginus, uh, Reginus gets his moment in the sun um, uh, in the form of uh, Renier, which is the newest uh, crew, which was only endowed in 1988. Um, moving on to Chenasse, um, the spirit animal in Chenasse is the oak. Um, Chenasse, one of my favorite crews, it is actually the smallest crew. Um, and uh, this is your bottle um, uh, from the brothers they are down. I fucking love them. Um, pretty good looking dudes too. Um, uh, you see the brothers, they are done. Uh, sorry, Zoe, not quite as good looking as uh, um, uh, Jean-Paul uh, Thibnay's son, uh, Charles Thibnay, one of the most attractive men in the wine industry I've ever seen. Uh, I'll pull up a picture of him later maybe, but um, uh, yeah, strapping lads. Um, uh, they're actually from Southern Beaujolais, but uh, they have a toehold in Chenas, which is uh, uh, kind of further north um, in the cruise. Um, uh, they um, went to a bit of cultural school, or actually uh, one of them stayed uh, on the family farm, but Paul, Paul Henry, um, uh, to your left there, uh, went to a bit of cultural school, um, and then his brother um, Charles joined later, and very much enthralled. They're kind of like the next generation um, after the Gang of Four, um, working in the same style, kind of cold carbonic, um, so a uh, same bit of cultural regime for the sake of this wine, uh, but different uh, terroir. Um, you are uh, in uh, Chenasse, um, which is adjacent um, to Moulin Avant, the king. Um, Chenasse um, has a storied history. Uh, Philip V, king of France, as early as the 14th century said, you know, this land is too good for its woods. Chenasse meaning oak. Let's knock them down and plant vines. That is the origin story of Chenasse. Um, you know, in the you know, 18th and 19th centuries, you know, your Parisian nobles um, were asking for it, uh, you know, by name. Uh, and um, you know, this particular offering comes from uh, actually a single vineyard. Um, so Chenasse, one of the more obscure of the 10 crews, not widely known outside of the region. I love that the brothers, they are done double down on that. They say, you know, you don't know Chenasse, fuck you. We're going to do a single vineyard version of this. You know, we're going to make you learn Le Monde. So this is Chenasse. Uh, we are leaning in to, um, you know, our typicity and uh, we are in Le Monde, um here. And um, we're actually on, you know, it should be said that uh, this little tributary of the Sone is significant because we have left the more heavy granitic soils and entered um, more alluvial soils here. 
um, what does that mean? What is this alluvium you speak of? Well, um, alluvium, you know, are, uh, you know, soils transported by rivers. Um, they tend to be heavier and richer um, in organic material. As such, they make wines that tend to be fleshier and fruitier, um, which is a great segue to Zoe. Um, Zoe, what do you taste in this particular offering? I think it is super bright. Um, I get all of the rose petals. Um, I know it's an associative property, but because there's a lot of um, alpine there, like I do get like a freshness of like an alpine cone, or sorry, a pine cone. Um, I have um, like a nice like brown sugar cookie as well. It has this like nice and um, like sweet roundness to it. Um, but it also is uh, quite salty and I really enjoyed that like saline coming through as well. Yeah, so we, uh, I briefly name dropped the manganese earlier. Um, manganese actually, fascinatingly enough, is poisonous to vines. Uh, it retards growth in the vineyard, um, produces more concentrated fruit, um, and is associated in Beaujolais with this saline character that I definitely get here. Um, I love how like fruit forward this wine is. It's got this like raspberry, like uh, juiciness to it. Um, that's just fun to me, you know? Um, it's just like, you know, juicy and pleasurable and, you know, um, you know, just like intensely fruity, but not in a cartoonish way. And that's always hard to do. I think it's always hard to do, you know, really ripe fruit without devolving into like Kool-Aid man territory. And, you know, this manages that, um, you know, it, it's just like sophisticated fruit. Um, and, you know, it, it's joyful. Um, and I, I find that all the fair down wines I've had, have had that. And then you, um, you know, reference that little bit of spice. Uh, character that's there as well, Zoe. Um, you know, I, I definitely get that as well. Maybe like a little ginger snappy thing um, on the back end. It's not profound and certainly not attributable to oak at all because, you know, we're, you know, entirely, um, you know, uh, kind of uh, raised in, in neutral oak uh, for the sake of this one. But, you know, there's this fleshiness uh, to this wine. There's this roundness um, to it. Um, you know, it, it's just, you know, it's immediately delicious. Um, and, you know, it's one of the, like, who wouldn't like this wine? I feel like you would have to hate fun. Um, you know, and uh, it, it's fascinating to compare it to the Renier uh, for me because it's a little less brooding. It's, you know, a little more uh, fleshy, um, you know, a little more driven by that red fruit character than that, you know, um, you know, salty, sinister fruits of the forest character that, that Breton's wine is. But I, I think, you know, that's attributable to some extent, uh, the elevation you get in Renier. And then, you know, there's more alluvial soils in this particular plot, this particular corner of, uh, of Chenasse. Um, any thoughts on these two wines from folks enjoying them at home, though? I know there's a lot of comments on the Fleury and the Moulin Vent when we get there. Well, let's, um, let's move on then. We can we can move on. Um, uh, I didn't share. This is this is Chenasse, guys. This is uh, <laughs> uh, you know fun with pink granite. I really need I need to stop. I, I'm gonna get a, I'm breaking out the phone for the sake of uh, our light. Um, and I, I imagine that this is like the least rewarding. Uh, viewing it's one of the least rewarding viewing experiences that we've offered since I tried to uh, show you the glow in the dark label um, <laughs> in our infamous uh, Sauvignon Blanc class but um, yeah under under so this is this is a uh, so this is probably more reflective of um, the granite that is on the opposite side of the tributary uh, from this particular vineyard but um, uh, it's strewn with with uh, you know you know there's like a, a pink hue in the mix here but um, Largely what in, in Morgon they would call, you know, uh, these rotted rocks, pied d'ore, um, uh, which is kind of like blacker um, in hue um, uh, and, you know, gives structure to the wines on this side of the bank. So um, without further ado. Um, so that is that is Chenasse, guys. I'm not going to look at that one. Um, moving on um, now to Fleury because there are a lot of questions about it and, you know, want to get to questions. Um, uh, Fleury is the queen um, uh, it should be said that I think a lot of that is, has to do with like a, um, uh, misguided translation of Fleury. So, you know, you think Fleury, you think Fleur, um, you think flower. Um, sorry guys, uh, another Roman, um, uh, Roman general Floricum stand up. Um, I bet you never imagined it in your own lifetime, but, um, uh, one of the greatest gametes in the world, uh, uh, is, is named after you, uh, to this very day. But, uh, Fleury, um, uh, is thought to possess this like uh, pretty florality. Um, uh, I think this wine definitely does. Um, I need you to understand though about this wine that it is made differently than the ones we have consumed so far. So this comes from 
a, uh, a merchant uh, family. Uh, they purchased land in Fleury um, and uh, they are um, Burgundian OGs in the heart of Burgundy, uh, in Volnay, in the heart of the Cote de Bone. Um, that is Michel Lafarge um, on the right there. It's three generations of the family. Um, uh, in this case, the estate um, is named um, after uh, the generation uh, currently um, running uh, the roost. That's Frederic in the middle. Uh, and his wife, Chantal, is Bial. So uh, Frederic uh, Lafarge and Chantal Bial. Um, that's their daughter on the left. Uh, Michel Lafarge is this like French OG I, I love. Um, he served uh, in the French military as is a Frenchman's duty after World War II. He was mayor of Bonnet um, for several decades. There's this long tradition in a lot of these smaller French winemaking villages of this crossover uh, between politics and, and you know, winemaking. Um, and uh, in France, they have this like deep reverence for their mayors. You know, the, um, it's not very different than our perception of mayors here. You know, it's actually a catapult in a lot of instances to, you know, kind of larger role in national politics. Um, and, you know, there's something like really stately and noble um, about, you know, his generation of French vigneron. Um, he is an early adopter of biodynamics in Burgundy and uh, Dominique, or sorry, Frederic rather, and Chantal brought that, um, uh, you know, paradigm with them when they came to Beaujolais and they purchased land in Fleury. Um, this is the first vintage of this wine that they released, single, vin uh, single vineyard offering, but it is made uh, not in the um, cold carbonic style. It is made more in the Burgundian style. So it's so a little bit of whole cluster in the mix, about you know, 10 to 20%, depending on the vintage, but largely destemmed and certainly less carbonic maceration in the mix. So it's a very different character, this wine, not only because of Fleury as such, but because of the way the wine is made. And it is the case throughout Beaujolais that as you go from the south to the north, especially with the communes of moulin Vent and Fleury, you see winemakers working more in this Burgundian style than the um, uh, Jules Chavez cold carbonic style. Um, and some of that, you know, fits the terroir, um, fits the, um, you know, uh, kind of fruit that comes off the vine. But, you know, some of that is, you know, just kind of a, a product of, of history. And then um, we're going to share the map again, um, because, you know, they did all that work. They dug all those boreholes. Um, and it's kind of cool here because you can actually see the single vineyard. Um, uh, in this case, we saw Blemont. Uh, before uh, Bel Air, so this is Fleury. A um, uh, lot of granite, a lot of pink granite again. Um, you'll notice a theme. Uh, and Bel Air actually is uh, Bel Air, not a very difficult uh, translation, in, uh, translation, you know, the, the good air. Um, and as you can imagine, you know, you're at elevation here. So, um, you know, these are contour lines coming up from the, you know, tributary. So you're actually uh, approaching Cherub, um, which would be the, the crew here. And both Cherub and, and Renier, they have higher elevation vineyards. So there's a freshness about this wine uh, because of uh, the single vineyard that it comes from. Uh, but it has a different character, it should be said, because of that more kind of Burgundian uh, vinification. Uh, Zoe, uh, let's get your tasting notes on this one and then let's kick it to the commentary uh, for the sake of all the questions. Uh, totally, I thought that this was much more structured. Um, you've said Burgundian and that's exactly how I put that down. Um, I thought that the concentration of fruit was um, much bigger than we've seen in the Chenas and the Rangier, and not to mention was much more like purple uh, leaning like plums and um, currants and blackberries. Um, someone said that it tastes like celery and I thought that was really interesting um, because I put down um, Trader Joe's has a um, crisp that tastes like Thanksgiving stuffing. Yeah. Totally yeah. tastes like that. Um, <laughs> it's I fantastic. Think that's a great tasting. I also get like a caraway or like a mm -hmm. celery salt thing mm -hmm. um, with this with this wine. I think that's a killer tasting note. I think like, um, again, you know, we're coming into like Thanksgiving season um, and Beaujolais just wants to go with Thanksgiving food um, for, you know, reasons that, I mean, I don't think the, you know, people who, um, you know, established the holiday after the Civil War imagined as much. Um, I don't think they were drinking a lot of Beaujolais, but um, at any rate, um, yeah, it's this wonderful kismet. Um, and, yeah, that savory herbaceousness, uh, something that, you know, this wine certainly has in space. It's a great tasting note. Um, from the comments, um, some people think it's like a little bit more barnyardy and has like a sweet earthiness, like Ooh, beet. Uh, just you wait until you try the Moulin of Bump. But yeah, right? it, it definitely has a little more of that. Yeah, well, that's going to go into a severe different direction. But um, 
a tasting of vanilla. There's like some lightness to it, like grapefruit um, texturally that it had a little bit more of like a pin prickle to it. Um, not necessarily fizzy, but it just has that liveliness to it. Um, I will say too, I think, um, you know, I think that structure, um, that's something you touched on Zoe, but this is the first wine we've had so far that has, you know, I think, you know, the, there's a little spice to the Chenoffs. Um, you know, the Renier was downright ethereal. This has distinct tannic grip. You know, it, 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 you know, it has that, you know, um, drying quality to it, um, you know, on, on the finish, um, you know, that uh, we, you know, typically associate um, with, with red wine. Um, so, you know, I, I think that's important to understand about it. Um, you know, I, I think uh, equally for me, though, it, it has this duality. It has that, you know, um, uh, prettiness. I, I think there is something floral about it. It's more, you know, purple flowers, lilacs. Um, and then, and then, you know, uh, purple fruits too, less of the red berries that you got with the Shanas and, and, you know, something grapeier, um, you know, which sounds facile in talking about a wine, but I, I you know, grapeier in a Welsh's sense, um, uh, but, you know, not in a bad way. Um, uh, and then, you know, there, there is like uh, something savory, uh, distinctly savory uh, about it as well. Um, uh, Fleury, um, you're getting into, you know, kind of a, a pure, harder rock, um, you know, kind of uh, place here. And then, um, you know, quartz veins uh, as well. So um, I know Rich, you know, experience it for yourself at home. Um, uh, but this is, this is Fleury here. Um, a little more quartz in the mix. Uh, you're getting into harder rock. Um, and it should be said that, um, you know, that quartz, um, you know, it grades slower than those other minerals. Um, and, and that will give you structure in your wants. Um, you know, so, you know, that harder rock, those thinner topsoils, um, you know, those, those uh, uh, you know, more readily draining, you know, kind of uh, topsoils will give you uh, structure, um, uh, grip uh, in, a, in a wine. So, you know, there, there is a bit of a, a, a kind of a serendipity between the fact that, you know, um, you're coming to this place, you know, that creates fruit that has more structure and then people happen to be working, you know, in this winemaking regime that, um, you know, further accentuates it. Um, so, you know, I always find it, especially in the old world, fascinating um, when, you know, that, you know, kind of uh, winemaking methodology grows up with, um, you know, this distinct terroir. And it's always hard to pull one from the next. And, you know, uh, living in the mystery of it all is, is really where it's at. Um, we're going to move on to Moulin Avant. Um, uh, Moulin Avant, so uh, we talked Roman generals, we talked oaks. Um, the spirit animal here is a little more straightforward. Um, this is Domaine Diachon. Um, it's the windmill. Uh, but before uh, we latch on to the windmill, I think we just need to, um, you know, give a uh, proper prop, a uh, proper, you know, uh, vas up uh, to Bernard Diachon, one of the greatest mustaches in uh, the wine world. Uh, Bernard uh, made wine uh, from 1967, took over from his father, through to 2007 when we handed off the reins um, to um, uh, his current uh, protege, uh, who's kind of, you know, maintained a lot of consistency for the sake of the house style. But um, uh, this is brought in by Kermit Litch and on his website, I love they say that it looks like Bernard's mustache has seen uh, the inside of a thousand wine glasses. I love that. Um, uh, but, you know, we salute you, you know, Bernard, long may your mustache uh, reign, uh, buddy. Um, but, you know, uh, I think it's something I love about Beaujolais too. You know, th these are farmers making wine, you know, nobody's driving a fucking Benz, you know, they're of the earth, you know, they're village people. There's something, you know, really, um, you know, kind of hobbity about the place. You know, it's a land of rolling hills uh, in a lovely place. And, you know, they're kind of like ribald and cantankerous. I hear these stories about, um, you know, they, they famously like come to, you know, kind of, uh, they come to, you know, brawl a lot. So, you know, there's this importer traveling with these two winemakers in Beaujolais. They were on their way to Leon. And he said that they got in this like heated argument, um, made him stop the car. They got out of the car. They fought like brothers, you know, for solid like five to 10 minutes. They had their dust up. They got back in the car, said nothing. And they were fine the rest of the day. So, you know, there is a little bit of that, you know, kind of, um, <laughs> you know, it's, it's a region of, you know, kind of, upstarts and, you know, kind of, you know, unpretentious people. And, you know, wine needs more of that, you know, wines of the earth that are unpretentious. Um, without further ado, so um, uh, this is from Moulin Avant. Moulin Avant is the king of the cruise. Uh, we're gonna share the rock first, actually. 
um, you know, because it's so rewarding for you at home uh, to see these. Uh, I hope that you can see there's a shit ton of quartz in this, all the quartz. Uh, and then um, near the, uh, the namesake uh, windmill itself, there's a shit ton of manganese. Manganese has all sorts of industrial uh, uses. There's manganese mines um, uh, in this region, uh, it should be said. Um, and uh, because, you know, the soils are riddled with it, um, it has this, uh, again, this uh, inhibiting effect on uh, the local um, uh, soils, the local vineyards. Um, and uh, as such, um, you know, the, the fruit is obscenely concentrated. And, you know, you get way more structure um, in Moulin than you do uh, almost anywhere else um, uh, throughout, um, you know, kind of uh, Beaujolais uh, proper. I'm actually gonna share the larger map because I don't actually know where the particular state is, is located, but the scroll north, you can see uh, Moulin Avant named after the windmill. I'll shame, uh, share a picture of the windmill. Um, it is hugely maddening, it should be said. So Moulin Avant, the crew here, actually encompasses the village of Chenas. So um, uh, the uh, crew Chenas is not actually in Chenas, you know, mind blown. But you can see Moulin Avant uh, here, uh, a lot of uh, red and orange, so all the hard granite um, uh, for the sake of these wines. Uh, this wine is made with uh, quite a bit of whole cluster, but um, it's made in a much more oxidative style, so they do a lot of pumping over. Uh, so they circulate the juice, which invites oxygen into the mix. And then the structure of this wine is just hugely different, uh, I think, than anything we tried before. Zoe, so, uh, what are your tasting notes uh, for the sake of uh, this uh, mustachioed gem? Uh, barnyard, crunchy, a ton yeah. of leaves. Um, this is where I get that like ginger snap cookie as well. Um, balsamic, more more poop, in a, you know, in a pretty floral way. Yeah, but like the good, the benevolent poop, the good, <laughs> the poop you want to drink, not not the, you know, not the one you want to kind of hold your nose up at. What's the French term? Uh, mad. Well, mad. I mean, the, the French, everything just sounds sexier in French, but mad, like they say like, there's an old French winemaker's expression just in the north. The good Burgundy has the soupçon de mer. So the smell, the smell of, of you know, the outhouse as it were. Uh, but they, you know, they consider that a, a you know, benevolent thing uh, as opposed to something to shy away from. Um, this is the, you know, the, um, the Instagram bait. Um, this is a windmill. It doesn't work anymore. Um, it's just a, you know, it's like a billboard for the region. Um, but uh, these are the individual vines. Um, I haven't touched on this before, but you know uh, what's also really amazing about this region is that there's a lot of old, really old vine material. Um, so you saw the beautiful uh, vines, and, and those those are the vines with the the leaves turning color um, as they are now. But um, uh, traditionally in Beaujolais, the vines aren't trained in rows; uh, they're trained in goblets. Um, so um, these are the the vineyards uh, that um, the brothers they are done preside over. This is kind of a mini goblet. But the tradition is just a, uh, an individual stake um, until these head trained vines can um, you know, support themselves. And then they evolve a life of their own, like olive trees, like humans. And um, you know, the wines we tried so far come from very old vines. I, I talked over the centenarian vines and Guy Breton's wine, uh, 40 plus year old vines for the sake of the Theardon. Um, uh, Lafarge ranges from vines planted in the 50s through to the 70s. Uh, this one uh, you know, uh, maxes out at 80 years, 80 years old. So. Um, you know, this wealth of viticultural history uh, in this region, um, you know, the bulk of vines um, uh, cannot be worked, um, you know, uh, they cannot be harvested mechanically. Um, historically, sadly, um, in terms of recent history, post-World War II, a lot of chemical treatments, but uh, for the sake of the wines we're tasting to say, none of that, um, you know, none of that, you know, kind of, um, what does is, what is Biden say? None of that uh, malarkey, none of that malarkey um, uh, here. Um, but, uh, you know, uh, there's a lot of great um, tradition to be reclaimed for the sake of these wines and, you know, to be perpetuated uh, for the sake of Dijon. And what I like a bit about Dijon, honestly, like, not one of the sexy names, you know, um, not one of the natural wine, you know, kind of um, in crowd, you know, but you, know, you can't tell me this wine doesn't taste natural. You can't tell me that it's not of the earth. You can't tell me that it's not both like rustic, sophisticated and charming all at once. Um, and, and I, you know, I want that out of a wine and, you know, this just delivers. Uh, what else you got for the way the question, Zoe? Um, Hugh's just stellar tasting notes, um, just on the Milan Vaughn. Um, everyone thinks that it tastes a 
a little bit like the uh, soil from Gary, Indiana. My apologies for anyone from oh, Gary, Gary. Indiana. Uh, yeah. um, a lot of like blueberry, um, brambly fruits. Um, yeah. and, and a lot of Irish. That's a great one. Indeed. Uh, Heidi wins with a poop from Satan's Cabana Boy. <laughs> Uh, that's, that's, these are all very, these are all very good. These are all very good tasting. This. I feel like this has been. Uh, Zoe and I often lament the fact that you know uh, people are somewhat coy when it comes to tasting us. Uh, maybe we just need to find the right wines. Uh, and it could be that we just needed to find the right wines because uh, you guys are, you know, between the celery and Satan's Cabana boys, uh, really over delivering uh, when it comes to the, the tasting us today. Um, you know, but I, I do. You know, I think furthermore, uh, kind of. It redeems my, my faith in this region for the sake of these wines because they're they're so evocative um, and you know a lot of people judge complexity in wine you know by um, you know how many descriptors they, they can throw at it so you know I, I, even they do that in uh, you know WSCT programs so you know like the more adjectives you can throw at something you know the more complex it is and um, you know these are you know definitely um, you know very um, multifaceted um, offerings, but, you know, multifaceted and widely refreshing and widely drinkable and widely food friendly. I mean, we haven't talked to, at all about Beaujolais food, but, you know, I think, you know, hugely rewarding um, for the sake of these wines. So I'm going to toast it out. I'm going to, you know, uh, I talked, uh, we, we, you know, I briefly, uh, you know, um, dropped the sex talk reference. This is from uh, the same article, uh, Jean Bonnet, and, and um, I like what he has to say about, you know, the, the, the place that Beaujolais occupies uh, for modern, um, you know, kind of uh, wine lovers uh, and Cru Beaujolais in particular. So uh, Jean says that uh, Cru Beaujolais, which describes wines that come from one of 10 villages of which we've explored four uh, so far, has become a juggernaut of postmodern wine. It not only serves as this current generation substitute for the red burgundy, which we can no longer afford, wah, wah, um, but something more, a totem of how wine itself has changed. The things we once considered informal side acts, wines built for their upfront drinkability and made without status makers like New Oak are now perfectly acceptable and embraced as great wines. So uh, I just wanted to toast for, you know, um, wines made uh, without pretension, wines made in the spirit of uh, um, upfront uh, uh, drinkability. Um, you know, we all need uh, more of that uh, in our own lives and I hope you're enjoying it at home. So cheers uh, to you all and drinking Beaujolais uh, along together. So I need a, uh, I was un utterly unprepared for the post daylight savings, uh, you know, light out situation. I feel like uh, I look particularly pallid uh, today without the lights. I think Zoe's going to, uh, everybody shield your eyes. Zoe's going to turn on, she's going to adjust my light scheme. Thank you, Zoe. Victory. Yeah. Yeah. There you go. Um, I wandered into the long, <laughs> I wandered into the, the wrong light, like, uh, like Cher and Clueless. Um, so, uh, at any rate, uh, uh, now you can see me. Um, so I feel like we've exhausted a lot of the, a lot of the questions, uh, that we, that we had. I hope you all are just, uh, enjoying the wines. Uh, it should be said, um, I hope that, you know, you're pleasantly surprised, um, by these wines to the extent that, you know, uh, you haven't had them before. I know we have a lot of Beaujolais stands in the mix um, all, already, uh, and God bless you. But if you're not one already, um, you know, please, um, you know, uh, if you like these, drink more of them because, you know, the, the wine world bends to your will. The mere fact that you ask for these wines um, and want to drink them, you know, means that, you know, more people like um, the Brothers Theardin and, um, you know, the Diachon disciples of the world, um, you know, can thrive and, and people that, you know, are inspired by them can continue to find a, a market for their wines, um, you know, in the United States and globally. So um, drink more Beaujolais um, in, in, all, in all seasons, but um, it is a killer Thanksgiving wine. Uh, it is kind of like a bit of a trope, a cliche uh, at this point, but, you know, one worth reverting to. Uh, what else you got, Seth? Um. When did the Beaujolais Nouveau celebration start? That's an excellent question. And, and I'm excited to further explore that uh, this Thursday. Um, I think it's been ongoing. So um, George Duboeuf uh, latched on to that um, 
as a, a marketing gimmick. I, I think it's something they've always celebrated locally. Um, he latched on to this particular tradition whereby uh, the, the wine itself, like the first um, uh, cask, was delivered from Beaujolais to Paris. And there was like a race. And George DeBook, being the marketing genius that he was, you know, saw opportunity. And he, he publicized that and then he globalized it. Um, and, and that happened started, starting in the 50s. Um, I don't know when the race itself started, and I'm, I'm excited to tease that out myself um, for, for Thursday's um, uh, soiree. Uh, but, you know, the notion of, you know, this, this early release um, is, you know, in a lot of ways as old as wine itself. Um, but, um, you know, this particular marketing fad is very much a post-World War II phenomenon. And in terms of its globalization is very much a, you know, outgrowth of the 70s. And I feel like a lot of the things that we take for granted that way are outgrowths of the 70s. For better or worse. Mm -hmm. um, can you distinguish um, a percentage of whole cluster blinds? Like if something is only like 15% versus something is like 75, is it that apparent for you? It, I think for, I think if you're clued into, yes and no. So, so that's a great question though. I think you would need, I, and like, I, I don't want to give myself too much credit as a taster. I feel like I would need preconditions. Um, whole cluster does a lot of really interesting things. So, so there are two different variables here. So there's the one that's whole cluster and then the one that's like, uh, this cold carbonic and, and they're not, they're different. Uh, and it's really maddening and, and people use them um, uh, concurrently. So um, carbonic maceration refers to this, you know, um, very specific regime whereby you don't crush anything, you introduce CO2. Uh, typically, if you're working like uh, the gang, uh, you know, used to and their disciples do now, you keep things cold, um, you know, and it creates a particular set of conditions that creates carbonic maceration. Um, you know, and, and carbonic maceration is one thing, but whole cluster often uh, uh, refers to using stems. So throwing stems into the mix and, and, and stems are high in potassium, uh, which will tend to raise the pH in a wine. Um, the same will happen with carbonic maceration because a carbonic maceration, essentially um, the enzymatic process eats malic acid to produce alcohol um, in the absence of yeast. There's no yeast in the mix. Um, uh, so you get wines with higher pH. Um, uh, stems themselves, um, you know, tend to give this herbal character to wine that I adore. Um, uh, and, and, you know, uh, I can identify that. I, I find that I can identify that as a signature. And, you know, I think, you know, for you tasting at home, I think it's, it's pretty, you know, uh, the difference between, you know, on one hand, you know, these two wines um, and, you know, this wine, I don't, you know, I think I could just serve you those blind. And if I said, you know, uh, you know, put these two, you know, I'm going to create two islands, you know, divide these wines, you know, by species, you know, I, I think you pretty readily, you know, put these wines on the same island and then put this wine on a different island. I, I think, you know, that would be readily apparent. You know, the trick of it is to, you know, then attach a name to that island, which in this case is, is called carbonic. Um, and then more broadly is, you know, that whole cluster thing. Um, I find I taste it, you know, in uh, Rhone wines a lot. So, um, for the sake of Grenache, which is a uh, really great, um, you know, flash forward because we're going to taste, taste through some uh, wines from the Southern Rhone next week. Uh, yep, man down. Um, uh, a lot of times they'll work with whole clusters, but not with carbonic. So they'll throw stems in the mix for the sake of Grenache. And I love stemmy uh, Grenache. Um, and I actually, I, I tend to gravitate toward those wines. So, um, you know, at first I noticed the difference when I was tasting things and they tasted more herbal um, and, and I liked them for that. Um, and then, you know, I read the specs on the wine and it was, you know, uh, you know, partial whole cluster or full whole cluster. And, you know, I came to associate what I liked with a particular technique. And, you know, I think that's the, that's the goal of it is to, you know, drink enough and then, you know, do enough, um, you know, reading that, you know, you come to make those associations and, um, you know, in a, a cellar, you can, you know, in an enlightened way, uh, talk about, you know, the process of uh, a wine being made and, and how that expresses uh, in the glass. Um, now that will express differently for Gamay than it does Grenache blends, uh, but there's congruity there. 
Um, and, and I think a good taster, yes, at the end of the day, just to answer the question circuitously, will be able to taste um, a certain amount of whole cluster in the glass. And it doesn't, doesn't always work. Just to say that, like, you know, I like whole cluster. Yes, I like whole cluster, but um, it, you, you can go overboard. Um, and people talk about, um, you know, stems, and they'll talk about, like, nerdy things like the linification of stems. Linification just refers to the fact of stems going from, you know, green and underripe to lignified, which is to say, like, um, uh, brown and, and, you know, basically dried out. Um, and, you know, the dried out ones being gold and the green ones being niche niche. Um, and yeah, there's some truth to that, you know, that's, that's it. There's some folly to that. Um, there's gross oversimplification there, but like you can overdo whole cluster, you know, just like anything else in life. So, um, I think that's about it for, for questions, I think. Oh, great. Well, I'm just going to sit in the window and drink more Beaujolais. Um, I hope that you all are enjoying your Beaujolais um, at home. Uh, Zoe, uh, just in the name of sh shameless self-promotion, uh, will be uh, holding down the fort uh, tonight uh, uh, for the sake of to-go orders. Um, we were preparing for wine that never came, or for rain that never came. Um, uh, and so we're takeout only tonight um, in the absence of uh, in-person dining. Uh, so um, if you don't want to venture forth yourself, we're on caviar. You can come in and see Zoe. Um, you know, she may or may not have a glass of Beaujolais herself in hand while fulfilling orders. But uh, yeah, uh, we're here for you for food as well, if you're so inclined. Thank you for uh, drinking with us uh, today and for their appreciating uh, the uh, great joy, uh, the guilty uh, pleasure um, that is Beaujolais. Cheers to you all. Salud.